Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. So glad you can join me today to get a portion of God's Word. Today we're going to start a new book, the Book of Romans. But before we get started, I just want to say congratulations on reading through the Book of Acts with me. That was an awesome book, and Luke explained the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament so clearly, and it's such an awesome thing. If you fell behind, don't worry about it. Just keep on keeping on. Just be faithful to the Word of God, and God will bless you for your faithfulness. All right, let's get started with the book of Romans. Romans, introduction. While the four Gospels recount the life of Jesus Christ, the book of Romans explores the significance of his sacrificial death and resurrection. As such, it has been called the Gospel according to Paul, written mostly in a question and answer format. Romans contains the most systematic presentation of doctrine in the Bible. But the good news is more than a theology to be pondered. It is a life to be lived, a life of righteousness befitting one whom God has declared not guilty. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Vital Statistics Author, Paul the Apostle Date written, around A.D. 57 Purpose, to present a systematic explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the church at Rome. The themes, sin, atonement, living according to the Holy Spirit, the place of Jews and Gentiles in God's plan. Day 317, November 12th, Romans chapters 1 to 3. Humanity's Need of Righteousness Overview Unlike most of Paul's letters, Romans is addressed to a church Paul has never visited. Resembling a doctrinal treatise more than a personal letter, it explores in carefully worded phrases the need, provision, and outworking of God's grace. Paul begins with God's wrath upon sinful humanity. Without exception, All have sinned and faced the condemnation of God. But there is hope in the person of Jesus Christ, through whom God provides righteousness to all who believe. Chapter 3, verse 22. Chapter 1. Nature of the Gospel, verses 1 to 17. Need for the Gospel, verses 18 to 32. Judgment. Chapter 2. Objects of the Gospel. Judgment. Chapter 3, Outcome of the Gospel, Grace. Insight, Paul's Gospel, Romans 1.1. Romans has been called the Gospel according to Paul because of its powerful and systematic presentation of the message of salvation. Sixteen times in sixteen chapters, you'll find the phrase, Good News, See chapter 1, 1, referring specifically to the message that salvation is found in Jesus the Messiah. Insight. A well-established truth. Romans 3, 10 to 18. In Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 18, Paul quotes from the Old Testament to establish that everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, is under the power of sin. Though this passage looks like a single quote from an Old Testament text, it is really a compilation of as many as nine passages from Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Romans chapter 1. Greetings from Paul. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised his good news long ago through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. 
In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who've been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. God's good news. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart, by spreading the good news about his Son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome to preach the good news. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. God's anger at sin. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who was worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning 
and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet, they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Romans chapter 2 God's judgment of sin. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God and his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts. For their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. The Jews and the law. You who call yourself Jews are relying on God's law, and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants. You know what is right because you have been taught his law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God. For you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it is wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say that Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God and true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Romans chapter 3. God remains faithful. Then what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? 
Yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. True, some of them were unfaithful, but just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. But some might say our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? And some people even slander us by claiming that we say, the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. All people are sinners. Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Christ took our punishment, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone is sin. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. There is only one God and he makes people right with himself only by faith whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. My Daily Walk Although scripture contains the best news one could ever hope to hear, it is first painfully honest about humanity's grim condition. Fill in the blanks. Our righteous deeds are like blank. Isaiah 64, 6. Our sins are red like blank. Isaiah 1, 18. Our hearts are blank and desperately blank. Jeremiah 17, 9. Paul the Apostle, echoing the words of David, the psalmist sums it up. No one is righteous, not even one. Romans 3, 10. See also Psalms 14, 3 and 53, 3. And what are the wages that sin and unrighteousness earn? 
See Romans 6, 23 for the answer. Now, do you understand why it is so important to view your condition the way God views it? Not as a character weakness or an unfortunate setback, but as a terminal condition. The prognosis is grim unless Jesus is your Savior. Is he? If not, new life is only a prayer away. Take him at his word right now. All you have to lose is a hopeless eternity. John 3, 16 to 18. All the sorrows of faith put together do not equal in bitterness one drop of the sorrows of sin. That is so true. That's all for today, my friends. It was great reading along with you. Have a great day. Keep up the good work. And keep on keeping on. And I will see you tomorrow. Lord willing, peace.